Iron City built. It's time for the Steel City Nation podcast. Here's your host, Mark Meredith. Uh, good evening, Steel City Nation. Uh, my guest this evening is the multi-talented Solomon Wilcott. Solomon, how are we doing this evening? Mark, I'm doing great and uh, glad to be on with you tonight. I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, you know, Solomon, you went from University of Colorado to the NFL for a while. Then you got into broadcasting. Now you're working in the medical field. Did you see these things coming down the pike? Were these aspirations of yours as a young man? Um, obviously, the you know working in broadcasting was an aspiration. I remember when uh, you know I was in uh, high school. I was going off to college. My mom asked. Well, what do you want to study? And I told her I wanted to work in broadcast journalism. I wanted to cover sports. And she was like, but you don't talk that much. <laughs> I remember, you know, your mother knows you better than anyone. Yeah, and I had three older brothers. And they kind of took all the oxygen out of the room. And I kind of just laid low and make sure I, I spoke only when I was spoken to type deal. And, but I told her, I said, Mom, it'll be okay. I think it'll work out. And fortunate for me, it, it did work out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're doing it. I mean, I, I really enjoy everything you cover, and and you've always been spectacular from from the first day. I mean, from about 1992 uh, when your career ended to today, uh, you have been doing stuff with the NFL. It's evolved quite a bit. Um, the positives and negatives you see with the NFL today. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Viewership supposedly down, yet the the quality of play I think is still pretty high. What do you think? The play in the passing game has elevated to an entirely different level. Um, when I played, most of the teams were running on first and second down. They would only throw on third down. They would almost forecast when they were passing. Right. They'd bring on an extra wide receiver. They'd bring in a running back who wasn't really a runner, but more of a, a running back who was like a receiver. I mean, they forecasted just by personnel by formation, you knew they were throwing the ball. But now they throw it on just about every play. And all the players are highly skilled when it comes to the passing game. All the running backs, the tight ends, all the wide receivers. Um, and so it's just that the passing game has taken the game and the artistry of the game, the beauty of the game to an entirely different level. The quarterbacks are not just better, there are more of them who are better. And so uh, I appreciate that part of the game. I do think the game has become overly litigious. And what I mean by that is the officials impact the game in much more bigger way. There's too many gray areas, whereas you may, it's so subjective where you may see something and then was it an arm bar? Was it a push? Was it a catch or did it not, was it not a catch? You and I can see the same thing. And you and I might be, be an official. And we might be highly learned in terms of what's the rule. But you and I would still come down. Oh, you would say it was a catch. I'd say it was, wasn't a catch. And you couldn't tell who was right and who were wrong. Because the gray areas for what determines a catch and what isn't, there's so much falls in this gray area of subjectivity where it, it, it's kind of robbing our game of some of its great credibility. And that integrity is very important. We should never um, flirt with damaging or harming uh, the integrity of our game. When people see it, they need to believe it. They need to know that it's real and it's instant and it's organic. Not that it's decided upon by, you know, a couple of guys in some back room are under a booth, right? And now they're going to determine the outcome of this game. We, it was never meant to be that way. I do you think that they should have more guys that are that are full time as officials then? Because you know you you got a lot of guys that you know they got a regular job and they come in and they officiate on the weekend. You think that would impact it more, or even so? On top of that, do you think if guys like you know when a player does something wrong, the players are reprimanded for it in some way, shape, or form? You think when guys influence a game that much that there should be some sort of repercussion for them? No, I, I think we ought to simplify it, not overcomplicate it. Okay. And I think what we need to do is get rid of the subjectivity. For instance, in baseball, if I'm a catcher and there's a pop fly and you're sliding into home plate and now there's dust, you know, dust flies everywhere because you're colliding with me 
the ball came down. You got to wait for the dust to clear to see if it was a catch or not a catch, if he was out, not out. If the ball's on the ground, what was it? That's what he's saying. <laughs> no, that's no catch. Yeah. If the ball's still in his glove, it's a catch. Yeah. I don't want to hear about a football move. I don't want to hear about any of it. If that ball touches the ground, and the rule used to be that way before the Bird Emanuel play. Right. Yep. If that ball touched a blade of grass, no catch. Same in baseball. If, it's a, if I can't trap a pop fly, if I'm coming in from center field and I dodge for it, if that ball touch a blade of grass, it's no catch. That's right. In our game, our game, the ball's bigger. It's more easy to see if that ball hit the ground or did it. And I think right then and there, we can clear up the subjectivity. We know if it's catch or not a catch. We can't allow people um, these gray areas. And I think we've got to get back to a, a place within our game where people have to live with outcomes. In other words, the fans get so irate when something doesn't go their way, everybody thinks they can go and protest somewhere. No, live with it. it everybody doesn't get a trophy at this level, right? That's it's not a participation thing. And so I know that there's going to be these calls that people are going to be, some people are going to be happy with them, some are going to be sad. But don't we kind of have that now? So, but at least we, can, we have hard and fast rules that we can live with, and we have taken the subjectivity out and you may say, um, you know what, that ball was close to hitting the ground. No, it didn't hit the ground, so it's a catch. We know that. We even have the instant replay to prove it. And then what, once we make that call, we live with it, and that's the end of it. You know one way to solve that is run the ball more, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Hey, hey listen, uh, it worked for the 49ers one year ago. Yeah. The teams that are getting back to running the football. This game is cyclical, as you know, Mark. Right. Um, the more we throw it, the more the team that really decides they want to run it against your cover linebackers and your cover corners and safeties that don't want to tackle anymore. Right. That team's going to be winning um, a Super Bowl by running the football. It, it's coming back around, and you know how this game is. Uh, when it's no longer in vogue, the team that could do it very well – that's the team that's going to start winning, and then everyone else will start to do it. I'm waiting to see the wishbone come back. That's what I'm waiting for. Uh, we, you know, hey, listen, Lamar Jackson might put it in this week. <laughs> he's, he's, getting, he's getting close, isn't he? He's getting yeah. close. He's a spectacular player. I, I know uh, I'm a Steeler fan, born, raised, the whole yeah. nine yards. Uh, but I, I really appreciate great football, and I really appreciate that kid, not only because he's a great football player, but I think his character's through the roof. He is just a – he seems to be just a, a great young man, too, and that's what the league needs as well right now. Yeah. Okay. So you're delivering football via Sky Sports Broadcasting in Europe. How are they absorbing the game? What's your job like informing them, teaching them? Well, this year I decided not to go because of the COVID-19 pandemic, oh, okay. global pandemic. I decided to stay stateside. But I normally do the pregame show. So on Sundays, when the games come on, just like here, you're watching a pregame show. They're getting you ready for all the action yeah. coming up later in the day. Yeah. So I do the pregame show there uh, at our Sky Sports studios in London, in the UK. And the fans there absolutely love the NFL. Um, you can go into Wembley Stadium in the game there, and all 32 teams are represented. In one family, I, I saw the dad wearing a Pittsburgh Steeler jersey, oh, the wow. oldest son wearing a Cincinnati Bengals jersey, one son wearing a, a Cleveland Brown jersey, and the other one representing the Baltimore Ravens. I said, I got to take a picture of this because never do you see this in one family. All four teams, right, in the AFC North Division represented in one family. So that tells you how, how broad um, the love is for our league, not just one team, it's for the entire league. You think there's going to be a team either transplanted there, or do you think maybe uh, uh, they'll start a team over there inevitably? I mean, like the Jacksonville play, let's face it, Jacksonville plays there every year. Uh, yep. do, do you think that Jacksonville inevitably will pick up and go to London and be that team? Or do you think they want to home grow one themselves? 
Yeah, the owner, Sean Kahn of the Jacksonville Jaguars, did say he's going to keep his team there. Now, but it's not lost to me that he did try to buy Wembley Stadium, okay, just a okay. couple of years ago. Right. Um, I, I think we could see either one. I do think Jacksonville, the Jaguars are going to stay in Jacksonville. I think you're going to see an expansion team when the league decides to expand. I do think you'll probably see a team over in London as one of the expansion teams. And I just think you'll find that that team will probably play two or three weeks at home consecutively and two or three weeks on the road consecutively. You so, think, I, I, you know, I think that's how you'll see it happen. When they come to the States, though, do you think they'll have a, uh, a facility and everything here that they'll report to and then move out from there to, uh, to actually play? when they're I, in the I, Yeah, I can see the league building some kind of home base, some kind of supplemental – um, workout facility, indoor facility for them to practice and train, um, or they may tell um, an existing team, hey, we'll need to share your f facilities during a bye week, something like that, you see. So um, there's a lot of different ways they can go about it, but um, they're real interested in just making sure that the competitive balance um, isn't harmed in any way, shape, or form by having a team travel. Uh, you know, the, uh, the long trip over there and not being so fatigued um, by the time they come back that now they're not the same. So how do you structure that? Maybe have a bye week after going over to play in London, then come back and have a week to rest. Um, does it give that team over there a significant um, level of, of, of advantage if yeah. you're flying all the way over there just to play them? So they're still weighing some of those things and, and trying to determine um, if there's an imbalance when it comes to the competitive level. I've always thought the bye, in terms of the bye week, I always thought that um, if you play on a Sunday, you definitely should not be playing a Thursday. You know, I, I get, <laughs> I that, agree. you know, not only the injury factor, but, you know, we're talking about grown men. I, I one time I read Ronnie Lott say that he felt like at the end of a game, like by Tuesday, he felt like he ran into a, a brick garage 40 times, and that's what his body felt like when he would wake up still on a Tuesday after playing on Sunday. These guys are playing Sunday, come back playing Thursday. That's insane to me. Like, we're not, we're not respecting that. You want to talk about respect for a human being. That's a lack of respect right there. Yeah, sometimes our, our drive to push our game and push our players and coaches, particularly when it comes for the economic gain, you and I know that's what that Thursday night game is all about. And, and no one, I mean, you know, most of your doctors would tell you you shouldn't be playing this game anyway because it's not good for you. It's certainly under those conditions to play on Sunday and then with on three days rest, you're back out there again. Right. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and in many cases that Wednesday you're traveling. And anyone will tell you um, when you're at altitude, your body's dehydrated. When you're at dehydration, you have more inflammation. The more inflammation, your body is more prone to injury. So, so it's really worse for the traveling team who's traveling, um, you know, two to three days later and then playing a game. Talk about setting people up for failure, right? That's right. It's not, it's not the best scenario. So we're talking medical now. We've moved into that phase of our conversation. Um, you're in the medical field doing some things as well. You're working with some CTE studies. You've done some things with the Alzheimer's disease. Talk a little bit about that for me. Yeah, you know, we do a lot of work with a public relations firm. We're based out of New York. It's called Russo Partners. And many of our clients are in the biotech, biopharmaceutical space. And we've helped um, enroll patients in clinical trial um, to, for uh, drugs to help with what we call um, neurological diseases, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. Um, CTE would fit in, into that space. We need more and more people, particularly when you show mild cognitive impairment. That's nothing more than you show some degeneration, neurodegeneration at a very low level, just in the beginning phase. You need to start getting uh, treated for that, or at least getting diagnosed and seeking treatment, because if we can treat you early, then we can prevent that downhill slide that takes us uh, towards some uh, unfortunate and inevitable um, circumstances. And so for many former athletes, 
there are a lot of great athletes. And I'm at the Hall of Fame ceremony in Canton every year, and I see all these great former NFL players. They've taken care of themselves, and their minds are great. They're sharp. And many of them played 15, 20 years with bad equipment. Yeah. And they're doing great. And so no one is here to blame um, these mild cognitive impairments, whether you call it CTE, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia. No one's blaming that on football. I, I love football. I think all of our young men should participate in football because it's a game that gives you, that teaches you leadership, teaches you how to overcome failure and bounce back and shake it off. And your self-esteem just goes through the roof, right? Teaches yeah. you how to work well with others. Um, there's so many wonderful things that this game teaches us. So um, I think a lot of parents should understand that you can play our game for a long time and still end up with a happy story because I see too many of these great guys at the Hall of Fame every single year. So that's a lot of the stuff that I've learned by working in the medical space. Now we have, you know, I don't know, if most people don't know that most of the Alzheimer's patients, um, by and large, it impacts women more than men. And none of these women participated in a collision sport. <laughs> so so I, I think in some way, shape, or form, the message has um, been sent out there that football, uh, you know, plus physicality equals uh, a life long um, road towards um, towards some bad things mentally. And I, I don't I don't see that happening at all. So I, I want people to know that. And that's why I love working in this space because we're doing a lot of good for diseases that impact a lot of people from a lot of different industries, both male and female. I interviewed Sean Springs recently. We talked for a while on camera and off camera. And it, he has a company going that that's what his thing is. It's the safety of things like, uh, of you know, of the sports. And I, yeah. I highly praise what he's trying to do to continue to, to help feed you to understand uh, how this is coming about and have you speak about it from the angle that you came at me at. Yeah, first of all, Sean Springs is a phenomenal young man. Yeah, he is. You know, I, I've known him since he was in college. I knew his dad really well. Uh, the late Ron Springs, who played at Ohio State, played for the Dallas Cowboys. And Sean has just always been so wonderfully representative of his father and his family. And uh, he's doing some really great work. And you're right, he's part of the educational base, part of making our game safer for young men to play it and helping them to understand and be more educated about the proper ways of tackling and playing the game. Um, and so Sean has been, I think, a tremendous ambassador for our sport. Uh, twice he's been, what, nominated as a uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year on two different teams. That That's says right. a lot about the guy that right there. That says a lot. Yeah, I, mean, I tell you, he's phenomenal. He, he is wonderful, wonderful. All right, let's move into the 2020 season a little bit. And I want to start in, in the AFC East. Um, you know, Tom Brady's gone. Cam Newton's there. Uh, that's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch throughout the course of this season. Um, you know, Brady being in Tampa, it's going to be interesting to watch that happen under Bruce Arians. Um, what are your feelings about about the AFC East? Let's start right there. Is New England going to own it still, or is this going to move into Buffalo? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about what Buffalo did this offseason. Well, first of all, New England is the team to beat, you know, Bill Belichick is the coach to be. Okay. Last I checked, he does have a quarterback who's a former MVP, a guy who's won um, uh, championships in college. He's, um, he's taken his team to a Super Bowl. And remember, their defense is built from the back to the front. Sure. It starts with their secondary. Right. And the only player lost from that group is Patrick Chong, and they, they have replacement. They have depth at corner and at the safety positions. So you're not going to be able to throw the ball over their head. They can tackle really well, so you're not going to be able to run right through them. They don't allow explosive plays. They have a true shutdown number one corner in Stephon Gilmore. And so for, with our PFF data at Pro Football Focus, we show that teams who have um, the best, most productive play at quarterback – and, can, and have a tremendously high level of play and pass coverage, those are the teams that usually perform well over time. 
week in and week out. Great stability at the quarterback position and the secondary lends itself to winning a lot of games and going deep into the postseason. And the Patriots fit that bill. Now, to me, the Bills will fit that bill. Their secondary is phenomenal. Sean McDermott has built that defense from back to front. We saw Tredavious White. He's now an all-pro. I mean, they're Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. They are phenomenal on the back end of that defense. And if they can just get Josh Allen to play like he did on Sunday, not turn the ball over, be very judicious and smart with the football, I think you're going to see Buffalo competing the way they did last year. They've gone to the postseason in two of the three years since Sean McDermott has been their head coach. I think they got a shot to win this division. There's going, it's going to come down to them and the Patriots. And the Jets right now, they're just, you know, they're, you know, they're, I, I think they're really struggling. They've got a culture problem where good players want out. I think my, Miami is an ascending team. You know, if they can get Ryan Fitzpatrick to protect the ball and not turn it over, you're going to see them win more games and, and potentially, potentially become a 7-9, and 8-8 eight eight team. What, at what point will Tua see the field, or won't he? I think they want to get him as much rest as they can for the first half of the season. And then they got to get him to the point where he can not only protect himself, but he's got good complementary pieces around him. But there is no doubt before the season's over, you're going to see Tua Tungavailoa because they want to get him some reps. You want, kind of like what you did with Patrick Mahomes, right? Right. You had Alex Smith. Before it's all said and done now, let's see what he got. And that dress rehearsal is going to tell you what you're going to get the next year because I think he's going to be the starter in 2021. Le'Veon Bell, I, I got to touch on him since we're in the East. The guy sits out a year. Um, you know, he signs with the Jets. It was all about, you know, I guess all about money for the guy, uh, you know, guaranteed money. Is he ever going to regain his career? Because he was phenomenal in Pittsburgh. Yeah, you know, he's still a good football player. I do think he's got to get himself in shape. He had the hamstring injury on Sunday. Now I hear he's going to be out for a few weeks. Uh, but he just needs to be planted in the right garden. That's what I always say. Players are just products and they're tools to be used to get the ball down the field if you're on offense, to help to stop other people from getting the ball down the field if you're on defense. And they need to be in the right system. All, all of us, all players are system players. Okay, <laughs> and once they're in that system, you either build it around them or you don't. And in New York with the Jets, they have not built it around Le'Veon Bell. And so, therefore, uh, he's a cog uh, of the wheel that's being misused, that's not being used properly. Because one thing we do know, he's got talent. Oh, yeah. One thing we do know, he's got all pro talent. He can run it. He can catch it. He can do a lot of why aren't they using that to leverage his ability to help them win games? I'll never know. I, I want to say that part of his success came with having a great line coach in Pittsburgh, too, though. I, I swear by Mike Munchak, and I'm going to say that as part of when I talk about Denver, but I just think the guy was able to coach those offensive linemen up just to hold it for that split second longer to give Levy on his opportunity, press the line of scrimmage, see his hole, make his cut, and go downhill. So. Yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, there is no uh, great running back without an offensive line that's working in concert to the way that the running back is being asked to perform. Right. We saw that with the great Alex Gibbs, former offensive line coach that was with those Broncos teams. Yep. Of course, that style has gone and permeated around the National Football League where you got the one cut and get going downhill style. Um, there are some coaches who let their running backs do different things. And that's got to be coordinated up front with the blocking game. Yeah. So wherever you go, wherever running back that you're going to feature in your system, you've got to really play to that or have the running back play to the style of blocking you you prefer to use. Let's go to the South. Um, you know, the Titans represented the South in, in the AFC Championship, uh, signed Derrick Henry to a very deservable contract. Yeah. They got Ryan Tannehill coming back, uh, player of the year last year, right? Uh, comeback player of the year. Uh, yeah. uh, can he step his game up, though? I mean, he's really – they're going to start scheming up Derrick Henry to take him away the mm -hmm. best they can. And it's going to be up to Tannehill to make some throws and, and lead that team a little bit more. Does Tannehill have that? Because he, you know, is, 
he didn't show it against New England in that game, and, and he really never showed it in Miami. What do you think? See, I, I, when, I, when I covered him in Miami, I thought he was right for the team. The team wasn't right for him. He elevated that team far beyond the dysfunction that existed there. I mean, look at what's happened since he left. Yeah. Remember, when he came there, they were at the bottom. That's why he was a high top 10 pick. Right. And then after that, they were right. They even made the playoffs when he was there. You know, he, he had a right at 500 or just below, just above it or just below it every single year. And then when he leaves, the bottom falls out. Right. And then, oh, by the way, when he leaves, the other team goes to the playoffs and go to a championship game. Now, Tennessee had uh, Derrick Henry prior to the arrival of, you know, of Ryan Tannehill. Where did they go and what did they do? True. You know, yeah. so now he comes in and I, I just think he is – listen, a lot of these quarterbacks are game managers. They do what's expected, they, but they make good decisions. That's they what I was looking it, for from you. They don't turn it over a lot. The good ones. They, yeah. find, they keep you in it. And they find a way to win. He's a play action pass guy. That's the same thing as Kirk Cousins. Yeah. Same thing with Jimmy Garoppolo. And we can go all throughout this league and say, oh, right, you get this guy some play action, and now he's going to stick the big time throw down the field. He's never going to throw interceptions or put the balls in, in, in harm's way. As a defensive player, that's what I want. <laughs> that's what I don't try to be magical. Don't walk. You don't have to walk on water for me. Just just make the plays when they're available. Don't screw it up, protect the football, and we're going to win a lot of games. I, Brian Tannehill, you can win a lot of games. Mike Vrabel knows this. Um, John Robinson, the defensive, uh, excuse me, the general manager there, they know it. That's why they paid him the money. If you go look at his contract, it's equal to Deshaun Watson's. Now, how about that? Deshaun yeah. Watson, known as the second highest paid player, they did an extension, okay, on, on Tannehill's deal but very equal in terms of overall cash value. Okay, them bringing in Jadavian Clowney, was that needed? You feel that defense needed that burst? Yeah, they, they needed a presence. Remember, they lost Jarrell Casey. They yeah. bring in Vic Beasley. He's yet to really report. He's an undersized edge rusher. And what, what uh, Mike Vrabel knows about Jadavian Clowney, because he coached him as a linebacker coach, a defense coordinator with the Houston Texans when Jadavian Clowney was first drafted by the Houston Texans first overall, is that he is a, he's an excellent run defender. The thing with Clowney is he tends to play when he feels like it, and he doesn't always feel like it. But when he does feel like it, it's spectacular. Right. And when he doesn't feel like it, he's missing in action. He disappears. And that's why you don't see him getting the money that he is purported – to the, that he should be earning. And so um, I think Mike Vrabel understands what makes him tick. They believe they can get him to play. Not a high sack guy. In fact, uh, there's not been a year where he's had double-digit sacks in his career. Never. Always single digit. In last year for Seattle, only three sacks. You're not paying, you're not paying $20 million for a run stuff, right? right? So that's where he is. And I've, I always said this about Jadavion Clowney. He's good, but he's not great. That's where he's at. That leaves it right there, huh? Because yep. he, he did the same thing in South Carolina. He'd have a couple spectacular plays that stood out. They were highlights. You'd see him on, on ESPN or whatever. But where was he the rest of the game? Could he set the edge on a sweep? Could he come down inside, pinch off? You know, yeah, I, I buy into what you're saying 100%. The rest of that division, though, you know, you got Rivers in Indianapolis now. Yeah. And a lot of people were thinking that bringing him in is going to make a difference. Uh, he's older now. Then you got J.J. Watt, who came back for Houston. He's healthy. I mean, anybody else going to challenge them in that division? Anybody going to challenge Tennessee from that perspective? I, listen, I think Indianapolis has a good team. They're waiting for a quarterback to show up. Now, I know Phillip Rivers is a future Hall of Famer. I mean, think about it. He's the all-time leading everything at the quarterback position in Chargers history. Yeah. yeah. So I think he's he, like Ben and Eli uh, from that draft class of 2004. I think he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He will be in Shrine and Camp. Now, what, can he still play at that level? Last year he didn't. Week one of this year he hasn't. And so if he can get it going, think about it. They have arguably one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. 
Um, they've gotten more physical up front on both the offense and defensive line. Forrest Buckner comes over. You look at their linebacking core. They're athletic. They can cover. And they're really, really good. And so this team should be much better, uh, but the quarterback can't turn it over. Phillip Rivers has got to lead and not expect the team to carry him. Well, that'll be interesting to watch as that, as that plays itself out. With Houston, I didn't like the DeAndre Hopkins trade. Um, yeah. No, that, that was me personally looking yeah. at it from my, from my perspective. What, what did you think about that? Yeah, I mean, listen, here's a guy that works hard, plays hard. Um, he's got a catch rate in terms of his percentage of when targeted and, and actually catching the ball is in the 90 percentile. I mean, this guy catches everything, drops nothing. But if you throw it in his vicinity, he's coming down with it. Yeah. And so you just always want to reward hardworking, highly productive players. He was that. Not to mention uh, being, uh, you know, from Clemson and your quarterback, Deshaun Watson's very young, but that's his guy, right? Yeah. That's the guy who helped recruit him to come to Clemson, the guy who he looked up to. That was his security blanket with this, within this offense. So I think you want to try to keep that together. Why Bill O'Brien felt it was necessary to break that up, I will never know. But so it seems like that team is kind of missing its heart and its soul. I remember Sparky Anderson, a great baseball manager of the Big Red Machine, for the Cincinnati Reds. He said, um, you need to know that one player that is the heart and soul of your team. Remember what Willie Stargell was for the old Pittsburgh Pirates? Remember yeah, sure. Was he the best player on that team? No. no. He was Pops. He yeah. was Pops. He, he was much older than all the other guys. Right? He didn't have the best batting average. He didn't have the most home runs. But he was the glue. He was the guy that kept them together. DeAndre Hopkins was that for the Houston Texans. And I think without him, they appear to have lost their rudder. Let's see if they can regain it. Let's see if someone else can emerge. Can, can J.J. Watt be that guy, even though he's on the defensive side of the ball? Yes, yeah, and, and I think I – think, I love J.J. Watt. But he was so much energy, so much hustle. I, I just see him as a player that's on the decline. I'm not saying he still can't be great, still not going to have his moments. Uh, but he's on the decline. Can he be that guy? Maybe so. But there's something that happened in that playoff game when they got up 21 nothing on the Kansas City Chiefs last year. J.J. Watt was on the field for that. And the way that the Chiefs came roaring back, they scored on eight straight possessions to close out that game. I know. And, and scored 51 points. Let me tell you right now, as a defensive player, that's got to take something out of you. And I don't know that you could ever get it back. No, oh, that, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, how do you play that team and prepare for that team now when you know that they know your weakness going forward? And it's right here. That weakness is right. Yeah, that's, right that's right. That's right. You know, it's, that's right. You know, it's equivalent to a heavyweight fighter. You know, you're daydreaming next thing you know. You're reaching for your mouthpiece and you're, you know, crawling on the, on the canvas and you were unable to get back up. That, that's a knockout punch, right? That's, that's, a, a T, that's more than a TKO. That's an overhand right. And the Texans got to prove they can get up. And they're going to have to prove they can do it against the Kansas City Chiefs and, and Patrick Mahomes. I know we didn't see it week one. It was just more of the same. Right. Uh, I think you got to borrow from some of the other teams that have beat them. The teams that have beat them are the teams that kept Patrick Mahomes standing on the sideline next to Andy Reid. That's the best defense you got. Right. Ball control, play keep away, run the ball, eat the clock, finish off possessions in the end zone, and limit their possessions. Got to come up maybe with a couple of turnovers, plus two, right? I think you do that. You can win the game. You can get out of there with a win. You think Kansas City got a little more dangerous with Clyde Edwards Alaire? Absolutely. Watching Absolutely. Him ball, he's, he, his dynamic he brings to a team that was already <laughs> it was already skill based was is phenomenal. I mean, who who challenges them in in the West? Anybody? Within their division, I no, I can't see it. The Denver Broncos, I thought, had a shot before losing Vaughn Miller. Because Von Miller, Brantley, Chubb, I thought that was the energy you need coming off the ball. 
the bookends, pressure Mahomes, and then give your secondary some coverage. Um, you know, I think it's a little early for Drew Locke and, and Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler and, and Cortland Sutton and Noah Fant, which I think is a real good core nucleus that could be good, but they're early. They're rookies and second year players. Give that some time to jail, and I think it could become formidable. I, I like the live arm of Drew Locke. I love his personality. I, this kid, he was he's got um, he's got more experience and more wins and played more than any quarterback in SEC history. I was Guy, sure. phenomenal. I was looking at the carousel as they showed on the game last night of the quarterbacks who've come through Denver uh, since they won with with Manning. And it, it, I just – I was beside myself. I couldn't believe what I saw, the guys that they had taken a shot on. So hopefully, uh, you know, Locke is the guy for them. They, they definitely need him to be the guy. And like I said, I'm going to go back to Munchak again. I, being an O-line guy myself, playing O-line – yeah, loving, loving, knowing that it starts right there in the trenches. That's right. Um, if he can get what Bill Dorsey, right? He's he's the one toting the rock for them. Am I right? Uh, and why they got um, Philip Lindsay or and Phil Melvin Lindsay, Gordon, Melvin Gordon, yeah, and Royce Freeman. So it's a three-headed monster. You're going to see all three of those guys. But Philip Lindsay uh, has has rushed for a thousand yards each of the last two seasons, his rookie season, and then again in 2019. So. I, I, he's a University of Colorado guy, so you know I, I got a root and pull for him. But he's got a big heart, and he is a tough runner and a heck of a competitor. I forgot they got Melvin Gordon. I forgot all about that. That, right. that, makes, them, right. that makes them pretty formidable uh, on yeah. the ground, too. Um, Vegas, is Gruden going to continue to change this team? Will this team evolve? I, I mean, I like Carr as QB1. I, I mean, what do you think? I think you can win with Derek Carr. Carr had a better year last year than he had in 2016 when he took that team to the playoffs, had the injury at the end of the year, but he was being mentioned as an MVP. Um, for some reason, I don't know, John Gruden seems to like circulating his name um, amongst, you know, potential trade candidates. John falls in love with the other quarterback too easily. <laughs> He's always – gloating over the net. We all say that his favorite quarterback is the next quarterback, right? Right. Sometimes, man, you got to love the one you win and cultivate and nurture that, you know? So I, you know, I, I, I just think, I'm going to tell you right now, if he gives up on Derek Carr, like how good do you think Derek Carr could be? Not that he would go here because how good would he be if he, if Andy Reid was his coach? Oh. He would be spectacular. He would be. Doing, he'd be doing what Mahomes is doing, basically. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, well, you're John Gruden. You play in the same division. You and Andy Reid kind of came up together in that system in Green Bay. Why can't you get that done with your guy? Yeah. The one thing we loved about Carr when he came out was what that arm town. Yeah, absolutely. He'd still sling it. Everything since John uh, Gruden took over the team, the average depth of target for, uh, for Derek Carr has come way down. His completion percentage has gone way up because it's dink, 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 dink. Yeah. Well, if you're wanting to be like that, 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 you know, that super engine, um, that highly productive machine that is the Kansas City Chiefs offense, push the ball down the field. You got a guy who can do it. Derek Carr already proved he could do it when he first came into this league. So I don't get that experiment. I, I don't, I don't, I really don't understand what's going on because I hear John talk about what he wants to be, but then I look at the data and I see what he's turned Derek Carr into. And then he claims not to be happy with Derek Carr, but we know Carr can play very similar to how, to how Patrick Mahomes performs sure. within that offense. Sure. I, I, you know, maybe, maybe Pittsburgh can fleece him like they did with AB and, and get Carr out of there into Pittsburgh if Ben oh, finishes yeah, up. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, John, we give him to you for hardly nothing. <laughs> that, that perfect with me. I mean, as a Steelers fan, you know, <laughs> the Chargers, what are we looking at with them? Tyrod running the offense. But, but you know, they got two – I think they've got two studs on the defensive side of the ball in Bosa and Derwin James. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, but can they compete? I mean, that, that's – that's, they lost the running back. 
They, you know, uh, they brought in Tyrod, which I don't know how much of a differential that'll make because I, like you and I had talked about earlier, we're getting to the end here with Rivers. So, yeah. I, I mean, thoughts on the Chargers? Um, very tough physical team. Good players uh, just about in every position group, right? Uh, Melvin Ingram, Joey Bosa, doesn't get much better. Denzel Perriman, you know, they get good linebackers. I think they got Patrick Queen, um, you know, in the back end. Casey Hayward's one of the best corners in the league. Derwin James, one of the best safeties in the league. Yeah. That's just like that all around, you know, wide receivers, tight end. I mean, it's like that in every position group. Now, the loss of Derwin James is critical. I mean, that, that hurts because he's so good at so many things, and he's so versatile and multiple in what he can do for you. To not have that player, uh, that's, a, that's a huge loss for the Chargers. Now, remember, you know, Austin Eckler is a guy that can catch it out of the backfield, so they've got to get that offense going. If it's not Tyrod Taylor, who I think gives them a chance – it's just that you can't be a quarterback that just gives them a chance. you got to be prolific. Right. You're in the same division with the, with the Kansas City Chiefs and with Patrick Mahomes, and they're just going to keep racking up division titles at this rate. And so it would be interesting to see how quickly they can get Justin Herbert um, up to speed. I'm going to tell you now, he looks good in the uni. He looks good when, when it ain't real. But, if you know, he needs some time to develop. Uh, but when the real stuff starts flying at him, that's going to be the real test in terms of how good he could be. I, I think the ceiling's really high for Justin Herbert. We just need to see him reach that ceiling. Learning under Tyrod, though, is that the right guy to have there? Or, you know. Yeah, because he, he sees an opportunity to play. Okay. <laughs> like the right guy in front of you is always a guy. That, now, if it was some incumbent, uh, veteran player who was very accomplished. And Tyrod is a veteran. I mean, he's going right. to, Tyrod is going to work hard. He's going to teach him a lot of the right things. Is he going to be a skilled and go out and win games and, and say, okay, that's how you do it real. You know, he's going to give it a shot. He's going to continue to perform and play hard. But uh, no, I, I think, uh, I think Justin Herbert on the talent side, it brings so much more to the table. And that's probably what they're just hoping for. I, t honestly, Tyrod has had a productive career. Yes, he has. Uh, yes. He, really, yes, he, he has a surprisingly productive career. When you go back and look at his numbers, look at where he's been and what he's done, he's really done some really good things. He, yeah. I, I don't mean to talk him down in the least bit. Uh, let's go over to the AFC North, okay? Uh, a division you're familiar with. You played in that division, two different teams, Cincinnati and, and Pittsburgh. Um, you still live out there in, in the Ohio area. Um, three potential young guns at quarterback, the old, the old gunslinger, as he likes to call himself, in, in Roethlisberger. Uh, yeah. just, first of all, does Lamar need to have another MVP season for the Ravens to play like they did last year? Yeah, the offense goes through Lamar. I mean, I think J.K. Dobbins with Mark Ingram in that backfield. And Mark Andrews is a phenomenal tight end. I mean, just – and they're, they're getting better at the wide receiver position so that when they start to spread around, take shots, the receivers can win against one-on-one -on -one coverage. There are a lot of good things to say about this football team and its offense, but no, it runs through Lamar Jackson. He's got he's to do two things. He's got to stay healthy. and He's got to continue to play at a high level. The only other thing is that they cannot get behind on the scoreboard. So that's the key. Ravens need to play with a lead. When you play that style of play, you better be playing with a lead. Because it's just like that's what the Texans did. Jumped out on them quick. And now you got to throw your way back into the game if we're not so sure. They can hit on the RPOs and the play action stuff. But when that run game is no longer an option in the run pass option, <laughs> can they be effective offensively? Um, I think every time we saw them fall behind in games, They've had a tough time clawing their way back. I mean, the vast majority of his throws go to the tight ends. Am I correct? Yeah. Now they're starting to get the ball outside the numbers. Um, in the Monday game, and you're right, uh, go back 2019, all the passing offense went through the tight ends. Um, but not on Monday. They're starting to push it outside the numbers. I think he was 11 of 13 for 10 yards on passes that went 10 yards down the field or more. 
and three of those um, passes were touchdowns. So he's becoming much better, and they're starting to design some things that allow him to get it outside the numbers because everybody's wanting to shrink it inside, and uh, he's going to make you pay for that. He worries me, though. Well, not personally, but, you know, he, he likes to run the ball a lot. I think he had something like over 250 carries last year, if I, if I remember correctly. That's quite a few carries for, for a quarterback. Is that a concern for them? I mean, RG3 is the next guy in line. Um, well, yeah. Happened? It's a concern. It's a concern. Because, you know, that's the only game that they got to let him play. You know, they try to tell him, be smart, get in the open, go down, try not to get into the collisions. But he's a running back. You know, he's like a running back who can throw. And he's fast, quick, and lightning. He can get to the edges of your defense. He can get to the second level of your defense. And at that point, it becomes a highlight reel. So, yeah, there has to be a concern because he doesn't have that big body like a Cam Newton where he could sustain a season um, of, of nothing but contact injuries. Right. Right. He, 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 honestly, Lamar reminds me of, of uh, Cordell in a lot of ways. He really does, except they built a nice offense around him where Cordell had to really uh, do some development there within that team uh, because they made him a slash as opposed to leaving him at that quarterback where he may have flourished a little bit more. Another one of your Colorado guys, right? That's right. That's right. That's my guy, man. So what do you know? Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, so now Pittsburgh gets, gets Ben back. Um, you know, Cleveland is another year formed together, but they get Kevin Stefanski calling the shots this year. Um, Joe Burrow is over in Cincinnati. Uh, who challenges then? Who challenges the Ravens? I see it as a two team race primarily between the Steelers and the Ravens, I think I, Cleveland could, could hard to Cleveland could come back and make this thing a three team race. I think the Bengals are a few years away until Joe can mature, you know, can mature uh, that the offensive line um, becomes replenished, but he's still got AJ green and Joe Mixon and some really good skilled players. And so, you know, no, I, I just see the, uh, Steelers and the Ravens contending for the title. And uh, there's no reason why a team who's had 50 or more sacks each of the last three years in the Pittsburgh Steelers and uh, Bud Dupree and T.J. Watt and, uh, you know, and, and Devin Bush and Cameron Hayward. I mean, they've got superstars on this defense, Minka Fitzpatrick um, included. Um, I, no, I, I don't see them taking a back seat to anyone. I could see Pittsburgh in. It's a done offensively. I could see Pittsburgh winning the day. Um, the NFC East, let's jump over to there now and move through the NFC. Uh, the NFC East, expectations are high for Dallas, right? Uh, <laughs> the Washington football club, the Washington football team, whatever you want to call it, they got a decent defense there. The Eagles still have a bunch of players who have left over from from their Super Bowl team, and then you got a rebuilding Giants team. Who who do you like there? Do you think Dallas is that team that that's going to win that division, or do you think there'll be a surprise come out of there? Uh, I think there could be. You know, I, you know, for one, Daniel Jones looked good. You know, against the Steelers. I thought they would annihilate and just lay waste to the Giants. Giants kept fighting. Yeah, Giants didn't make it easy on, on, on the Steelers at all. Daniel Jones is a fighter. He was engineering a 19-play drive, and then he got a little bit greedy, came back to haunt him, and then Ben just went to work and put him away. Yeah. But the Giants, and, uh, I like Darius Slayton. I like Daniel Jones. <laughs> they need a little bit more. Um, so, you know, but the watch, you get 31 total pressures and eight sacks on a team like the Eagles. The Eagles are loaded. I think they're a very good team, very good roster. You do that. Um, I, I, you caught my attention. So I, the Washington football team and Ron Rivera, I, I just think they, if they get to about 50 sacks, and they already have eight. 
<laughs> they're one almost one fifth of the way there. And and this Dwayne Haskins does anything. They could scare some people and they're gonna beat a lot of people and they're gonna they're gonna plunder your quarterback. So I no, I think you know Dallas, I thought Dallas and, and the Eagles were the, the cream of the crop, but those other two teams are so hungry and fighting. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be a four-team race the entire time. Dallas is going to bounce back, but be careful with those Giants. I think Jason Garrett is a tremendous play caller, and I think um, he's going to. I think he's going to make Daniel Jones into a star. I, do you think Dak not having a contract though? I mean, do you. I, I, he seems like another guy who's going to play super hard to get that contract. Is he going to get that contract in Dallas, or is he going to go somewhere else? I think he gets a deal there because he's going to keep playing, keep playing well. And if he doesn't, <laughs> someone will pay him a lot of money. He's already getting $31 million a year. And what we've seen from these franchise deals, that number does not go down. Right. It does not go down. It only goes up. It only goes up. I, and now they lost uh, They lost their inside linebacker. What's his name? Uh, Vanderbosch? Is that what it is? They, yeah, Van Der Esch. Van Yeah, he he, you know they they can't afford to lose guys on that side of the ball. Um, good good thing Sean Lee is still available. Sean Lee stayed and came back for another year, so they still have Jalen Smith. Sean Lee is a smart and savvy player. This is what happened last year when when Van Der Esch left for the season, and now they're going to just be able to pencil Sean Lee the. KGO veteran back in there, and they're going to keep it rolling. I know uh, Wentz signed a big contract, but is he going to have a point where if he's not producing, he's going to look over his shoulder at Jalen Hurts? I mean, they didn't bring him in to sit around, right? Yeah, if he doesn't stay healthy. If he doesn't stay healthy, he got beat up, man. He was sacked eight times. I don't know how he survived that. The Redskins are, excuse me, the Washington football team. Yeah. <laughs> they have five, five. First round picks on their defensive line, I know. including Chase Young. So uh, they got after him. He was sacked eight times. And Carson Wentz is a good football player, though. So he'll he'll bounce back from it. Uh, but you see that offensive line in front of him isn't really good. Last year was the wide receivers. This year the offensive line appears to be disintegrating. Green Bay, moving on to Green Bay in Detroit, Minnesota. Green Bay, do you think Aaron Rodgers has a chip on his shoulder going into this year? I, I think they, honestly, he's up there now. What is he, 36 years old, almost 37 years old? Um, you know, I, we talk about Minnesota having a good defense and being productive too. Who do you like in that division? Does anybody stand out? Is Green Bay still the team to beat there? I picked the Vikings to win it, but that was before Daniil Hunter went down and all these rookie corners, you know, and no real offseason. Uh, no, I got to go back to the Green Bay Packers. I thought Aaron looked good. He's going to always look good. They're going to be able to run the ball if they have to. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I just think that they're so good defensively. I love Zed Smith. They're very good defensively that they can – come up with enough stops. Cover is really good on the back end. The front pressure uh, is real good on the front end. And uh, Green Bay Packers are the cream of the cup. Now, the Chicago Bears, they could come out of nowhere. I know. Okay. Depends on who's that quarterback, whether it's Nick Foles or Mitchell. They they shape up very well. They they actually have a fallback now if, if Trubisky doesn't – doesn't perform. I think that's great. And plus, they're, they, Chicago still reminds me of old school Chicago. They want to pound the ball and play defense. And they've got they've got some solid people there to make that happen, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt. I mean, they, I think they're just going to be a really good football team, and they'll continue um, to move forward. And you know, they've got to have improvement. And if that continues to happen, they'll. I think they'll be just fine. I. I'm a big Matt Stafford guy. I think he's a phenomenal quarterback. I would love to see him one year actually be able to make that big jump. They always just seem to teeter right there, 500 or, or something like that. They grab yeah. a, they grab AP. Is that going to help? Yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, you know, in Sunday's game, they were without Kenny Galladay. He was injured with a hamstring. They were right. also without Jeffrey Okuda, the number one comfort corner. Matthew Stafford seems to always just get him there. But then the team doesn't come along. He's got to drag that team along screaming and kicking, Mark. You know, he he had the game-winning touchdown. Andre Swift couldn't hold to it. He dropped it right there in the end zone. Yeah. So after Trubisky did all what he did with the three touchdown passes, you know, Matthew Stafford engineers a game-winning drop right in the end zone. He puts it on the ground. And they lose. And and Matthew Stafford's going to keep fighting. But, man, I'm, I'm starting to really feel bad for him because – he tried. He tried to change that culture. He tried to build, but man, they they just will not come with him into the promised land. It's almost as if they, you know, he's got to drag them in there, screaming and kicking. Why can't Patricia build a defense there like he had up in New England? Or was that in place for him up in New England, and he just rolled with it? He just was able to call the shots. Oh, well, the personnel you need. To, they run cover one and zero as much as any team in the league. The only other team that runs it more are the Patriots. Okay. Darius Slay didn't like it. He didn't, He just thought that it was too demanding. Um, they bring in Okuda. He's hurt. And so all the other guys are going to struggle because you can only go hand a man. Play it. I mean, that's what I know in this league to go one-on-one, -on -one, press, bump, man-to-man, -man, ask guys to do that and, and survive. And, man, that's not, that's not easy. New England's made it look easy, though, for a long time, don't you think? Yeah, they did. They had, yeah, they had good coverage on the back end and good pressure on the front end. Yeah, they were able to survive it, and they're still really good when it comes to their coverage units. Absolutely. He, gets, he seems to find the right guys to plug in there that, that just do exactly what he asked them to do, and they don't try and do any more. And they, Obviously, that's what makes them so special. Um, Tampa Bay – New Orleans, Carolina, Atlanta. That's quite the division, okay? Carolina, obviously, new coach, new philosophy with, with Teddy Bridgewater there at quarterback, and to a certain degree. Um, Atlanta still going with, um, you know, Matt Ryan uh, and moved on from Tevin Coleman on the offensive side of the ball. But this is really probably a, a two-horse race here between Tampa and New Orleans. Um, how do you see that playing out? I mean, <laughs> Tom Brady went to Tampa to win, right? He wants to prove that he was the guy in New England. No doubt about it. Your thoughts on that? The NFC South division, I think, is a good one. It's always competitive. I think you're right. It's, it's about the 40-something-year-old quarterbacks, right? Drew Brees. Yep and Tom Brady, and the team and how they rally around their leaders. Uh, both quarterbacks, I think, are going to play well, not turn it over a lot, give their teams a chance to win. Um, you know, now, you know, the Saints are stacked. They got good offensive line. They got good receivers. They got a good running back and Alvin Kamara. Um, they've got uh, really good defense, good secondary. And so the Bucks. You know, they're as good as any in the league over the last eight games of last season in terms of coverage, in terms of doing all the things you want to defense, pressure, everything. And so that defense has got to play better in 2020. And Tom has got to get the receivers off uh, in terms of playing and playing very well. So um, Leonard Fournette, I think, gives them a banger. Um, and I think the other guys can catch it out of the backfield. So they've got some versatility. To me, it's about the Bucs and it's about, um, it's about the New Orleans Saints. Carolina Panthers are building something. If they can just go out and compete each and every week to make it hard on their opponent, they're going to just continue to grow and ascend. And so uh, the Atlanta Falcons are the team that perplexes me because they've got so much talent. They're so, they, they've got a lot of talent, but they just don't know how to win games when they have to. They start off one and seven. Seven last year in the first eight games, then go six and two in the final eight, save everybody's job, and then they come out week one at home against Seattle in 2020 during a global pandemic and laid an egg. So, I, you know, I've learned that whenever you start to believe in the Atlanta Falcons, they're just good enough to let you down. 
<laughs> and traditionally, you know, a team coming, and you know this as a, as a former player, traditionally a, a team coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, there's some sort of lag there for them, or going from the East Coast to the West Coast. It, it makes a difference for them to do what they did to them, though. That was uh, – <laughs> I don't know. You're right. They did lay an egg. There's no doubt about it. But last division, um, because San Francisco's in this division, I'm going to let you talk about what you think's going on there. Uh, is Kingsbury going to get Arizona to, to the next level? Can you know what, What's going to happen? What's going to happen out there in the West, the NFC West? I go with who's got the best quarterback, Seattle. It's Russell Wilson. Yeah, Let's be honest. absolutely. Um, Probably the best coverage units is probably San Francisco. Right. In terms of front end, back end, San Francisco. Um, but an ascending quarterback that maybe we're not paying attention to is Kyler Murray. And given what Isaiah Simmons could ultimately become and the way his defense played against the 49ers, don't be surprised if they keep into it. If they creep right there, Arizona could creep into the conversation. I would need to see more from the Rams. I like the fact they've gone to this three-back system uh, with a group of guys that they want to play in, in, in the offensive backfield, Cam Akers included. Right? Um, they just to be a much better offense um, because they have different style of runners. And uh, if they can run it, then the play-action pass game is what really works in the RPO games. It really does work for Jared Goff. And the receivers – are much above average group of receivers. They're very good. And so they've got enough to come out and beat you now. I really do believe that. The, the Rams showed me something against Dallas. They've got the best defensive player in the league. When I watched him rush the other night and just push one lineman into the other lineman and still get to the quarterback all in, you know, three seconds or whatever it was, it's just amazing to watch what Aaron Donald could do. He's like having three guys on the field playing on that defensive line as opposed to just one guy, he really. He's definitely the difference maker and deserves defensive player of the year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Aaron Donald's phenomenal. He's so fun to watch. He's so disruptive uh, and hard to match up with for anyone who's got to put a body on, on Aaron Donald on every single play. Matter of fact, make it two because he is that good. He frees up other people to make plays. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, so my last question. Your conference champs and your Super Bowl team, uh, who do you think? Who do who you like winning the conferences? Who you like going back to the dance? Kansas City is back in it for the AFC unless Pittsburgh has something to say about it. And I think there's a good chance for that. Got the NFC, I, I really think Pete Carroll – and the Seattle Seahawks are going to be a really good team. They were inches away from winning that division last year. Had they won it and got the home, you know, things turned different for them. Because Russell, if you give him the ball at the end of each game, nine times out of ten, he's going to win. Yes, I can just tell you that. Yes, he, he's that good. Um, and I see him coming out of the toughest division. And I see him uh, playing at a high level even in the postseason. Solomon, my last segment that I do, I'm, I want to include you in it. Um, you have covered many, many sporting events, some high-level events, anything from U.S. Open qualifiers to three different Super Bowls. What were the four most uh, memorable events that you covered throughout the course of your time at this point? Four most memorable, wow. Um, 2012 Super Bowl. The night the lights went out, Baltimore Ravens, San Francisco 49ers. I will yeah. never forget it. I remember there was this, there was this eerie feeling that could this be another like 9-11 event? But calm, calm prevailed. We we continued with our production, and um, you know that was interesting because I remember going over to Coach Harbaugh, uh, John, not Jim. And I said, what are you telling your team right now? Because the lights are out. He said, I don't know. What should I tell them? <laughs> I said, well, you know that guy over there better than anybody. He's right now, he's getting this team ready to mount a comeback. You better get these guys ready to play. You know, now I'm thinking like a coach, Mark, like you would, right? You're thinking it's about, it's about hitting a reset button. 
you just had the momentum. This thing just robbed you of that. Yeah. You know, you better you better get their attention. He went over there, man, and he started coaching. <laughs> you know, and I, so I and then of course they ended up winning the game. And man, I just it, it was such a wonderful evening. Another one was the Super Bowl. That was the one I think in 07. Um, uh, or 09, I think it was the New Orleans Saints beat the Indianapolis Colts. Oh, okay. That's a great um, one. That was the Saints team that had been through a lot. And now, was it the same year as you know, Because at that time, I did their, uh, their preseason games for the New Orleans Saints. I had been with them. And I think I said before the game, I said, uh, oh, uh, I've been with the New Orleans Saints going back even to a training camp. And tonight they are um, just as ec ecstatic and carefree as they were back at the beginning of training camp. They know that tonight they're going to have to do something special. They've got to find a way to steal an extra possession away from Peyton Manning. Look for them to pull out all the stops to win this game. Yeah. And they remember the onside kick coming out after halftime. You know, it's like they stole another possession. And then they got the interception, Tracy Porter picking off Peyton Manning. That's how they won the game. Yeah. So I, I kind of felt like Nostradamus on that day. And now my other one was, again, covering the NBA finals. Um, uh, and that was when – I remember Sean Elliott stepping back. His heels were just over the out of bounds line, and he stuck that stuck that shot because I spent a lot of time with Mario Ellie and Avery Johnson, really smart guys, you know. And they were helping me um, to understand what was going on. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what. And so I just felt like I was dialed into everything. I got to get to know uh, Greg Popovich and what a great coach he was. And that made an impact on me. And Another was just a sort of Bobby Knight. He's coaching at this tech. He had already left Indiana. I wanted to know if I would, he would do an interview with me after the game. Yeah. He, he, he hated doing those side interviews, right? And so I remember he says, all right, if I decide to do it, if, right, if I decide to do it, don't come talking to me with some Jersey accent. Now, that was a shot at, Bill Rafferty, who had the Jersey accent. Okay. So after the game, Texas Tech win. They come to me live with the cameras. I'm, I move in on hugging, start interviewing him. And I, you know, he answered all my questions. He's smiling and laughing. You know, Bobby Knight, man, it's rare you get the smile and the laugh. And uh, so then by the time I was done, my final question was coached. Thank you for doing the interview. And how did I do with my Jersey accent? And he just he hugged me, said, ah, I love this kid. I love him. <laughs> so, you got to understand, that's about as much of an approval you're ever going to get from Bobby Knight yeah, because yeah. He, he was one. He always made me a little intense. Man. Huh? He always made me a little intense just watching him coach. Uh -huh. Like he made me a little nervous. Oh, he intimidates everybody. Yeah. That's why they called him the general. Yeah. You know, and, but he was, I spent time with him, and he was just, he was just so, uh, a, just a wealth of knowledge, a brilliant person, one of the great teachers that sports has ever seen. Uh, he's up there with the John Woodens of the world, with the Vince Lombardis and the Bill Belichicks. One of the truly great teachers in sports. Named my son after Vince Lombardi. That shows you how dedicated to football I am, Vincent Thomas. And my wife picked that, to be honest with you. You got to tell your son, that's a lot to live up to now. Uh, he knows, <laughs> he knows that. Bring it. <laughs> he knows that. He's 10. I'm taking it easy on him for now. So There hey, you go. There it's you been go. spectacular sitting here talking with you, going through the league, talking about your career. Um, it, what a wealth of knowledge you bring to the table, and I really appreciate it. Mark, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. We wish you all the best of luck during the upcoming season and for the remainder of the year and into the new year. Stay safe, okay? You too. Thanks, Solomon. All right. All the best.